Good morning. <laughs> Music stops. We all have to find chairs. So it's okay. Right. Welcome to worship. Welcome to being together to honor God. And we're together, some of us in the same room. Some of us are together because by our focus, we're gathering to worship via Facebook and other means to together say, Lord, here I am. Have your way in my life. Before we go further in our service, just a few things to just run over. One, let's take care of each other with the safety precautions. You know, I'm, I take my mask off to speak. Otherwise, I'll be putting it back on. Let's make sure we just take care of one another. Um, Sunday school is going on. We're glad for our teachers, glad for those who are uh, doing everything they can to uh, remember the youth that are rising up to be our next uh, generation. There's some neat things coming ahead with them. But uh, we're, we're well now beginning our uh, Lenten services. The, uh, the third Wednesday of Lent is this coming Wednesday. And uh, Bruce Barden, who is better known as Bonnie's brother, will be, um, will be the preacher. And you can go to our Facebook uh, channel to just tune that in. These are all virtual services, these Wednesday nights through Lent. And so uh, we, can, uh, we can participate in that way. Our annual meeting is today. Mr. Moderator? Once a year, since something like 1748, this church has gathered to have its annual meeting of membership to act on important business for the, the next year uh, to arrive. And it will include things like, as announced in our call to the meeting, which has been posted and shared by electronic uh, means. Uh, we will be meeting here at 11.30 a.m. to hear and uh, comment on reports of all officers, boards, committees, and teams, to hear the report of the nominating committee and act thereon, to hear and discuss and act on the 2021 church budget, and to address any other uh, appropriate business that may come before the meeting. Uh, we do expect to achieve a quorum. We did a dry run last November. We had a meeting where we, uh, it was a, an official church meeting, and some were here and some were present electronically. That worked well. We hope that will happen again today. So again, the official call has been posted uh, both by the old-fashioned paper means and by many other means, and uh, we will meet today at 11.30. We look forward to everyone's participation. Such a year it's been, we expect to have um, a few little slightly different ways of looking at information, but we thank you in advance for your grace and participation. Thank you, Phil. And just a reminder that the, uh, those uh, participating remotely um, it is not by Facebook Live, but by anyone who has sent in a, uh, a, uh, an RSVP of saying, yes, I'd like to attend uh, remotely, um, is given the link to the, uh, the Zoom meeting. So uh, that's part of the break between the service and the meeting is for our tech folk to, uh, to switch their mediums, as it were. It's a rather rare medium, well done. Never, no, no. The, the, uh, tonight, we are having um, the Glory of God gathering, which is, this will begin the third year of Glory of God South Shore. It's a movement that uh, started really on Cape Cod and has, has moved on over, where churches from many different settings um, get together to worship together and bring honor to God that way, but also to pray together for revival, for um, an interest in many different areas of um, community life. And so uh, this one is also particularly interesting in that well, as many of the, of the churches participating worship like our uh, contemporary service might, um, they've deliberately asked a couple of congregationalists, Susan Thornton and myself, to lead in, in the traditional ways that may have helped establish a foundation for this area. So uh, we're uh, looking forward to doing that, and, and I've got a, a message that I'll be bringing. That, so it's gathering at... Sacred Heart High School on Bishop's Highway in Kingston for 6 p.m. And it'll also be available on YouTube. And you can just search for Glory of God South Shore and you can get that there. Um, there's more information on the precise way to, uh, to type in an address in the bulletin if you'd like to participate in that. We'd love to have you in person or uh, online. 
Okay, uh, Sarah has been doing a wonderful job putting together a Soul Sabbath one day retreat. You all have a little insert about it. I would just really recommend that everyone, um, if that can, take part in this. This is a great time of, of life to go deeper, you know? There's fewer things we can go out and do, so we have the opportunity to um, deepen ourselves, to put the roots down. You know, a, a tree that with strong roots can handle storms. So let us be about that. And so uh, please look over all the information. You can uh, go fancy and grab the code off of this uh, QR code here and uh, get all sorts of information on it. But uh, let Sarah know that you'll participate. So that's there. And it's also available for our folk who are online watching. Lenten boxes, a great tradition of our making a special effort of support and of doing justice during this time, is particularly this reason. Uh, justice and mercy, as the collection will benefit the South Shore Women's Resource Center. Uh, Bob and his team are gathering Monday nights for our Bible study on Ruth, a great book, a pivotal book, many important lessons in it, and I encourage your participation there. Pledge envelopes in the narthex with your name on the top. And if you need it delivered, contact Shirley. Her phone number is on the screen. Great. We're glad for worship tech. I noticed in the calendar that Frank's got a, uh, a training day set up. Anything to add on that, Frank? Yeah, there's a light bulb in it. It should be the 20th, not the 22nd. Okay. <laughs> Great, and and as many as want to, and, and younger people who may uh, wonder, gee, how can I take part and whatever? Uh, you're more acquainted with tech than many of us, and so it's a great place for you. Good. All righty. So if you're tuning in by way of the uh, by the internet, by the Facebook or YouTube or any other means, um, please do go to the website at fcchanson.org. Click on Let's Connect. And please uh, send us an email. And again, as always, if you're watching on Facebook, please just give us a good morning at the very least. Let us know you're here, um, that uh, we can say back good morning to you, but also just be aware you're there because we still want to be a community and still caring for each other. So we look forward to hearing from you. Great. We are watched on Facebook Live, YouTube, our FCC Hansen channel, Community Access TV Channel 9, and audio CDs. And we're still aware of that. We want to be uh, continuing to reach out to everyone for that. Thank you for your attention to those. Let's uh, continue and really get into the worship as we uh, stand together for our call to worship. Good morning. Please join with me in the responsive reading. It's taken from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even, even when, when we, we were, were dead, dead through our, our trespasses, trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By, by grace, grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, so that, that in the ages to come, come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness, kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not, not the, the result of works, so, so that, that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Grace is enough. Thank you. 
You know, in these times when we can't get together as easily with people that we love and care about, don't you find that news about folk and learning more is, is dearer because it's harder to come by? And one nice piece about that is our, uh, our dearly beloved um, Sue Staples. Uh, Sam heard from her, had a nice conversation, and really she's doing well. She, you know, she'd had a second stroke, but the voice is recovering, the speech is, is there, and, and her, you can just tell the dear love that she's sending out to each of us. Um, thank you to everybody who gets us prayers through prayers at FCC Hansen or any other means. We, we are, just want to be uh, together, a family of God, praying for each other, supporting each other, and knowing that when many pray as one, God moves in a wonderful way. Um, if there is a tender need in your life. We just recommend Carol Gillis as somebody who will individually pray with you. She can do it over the phone. Um, you can call her the number that's on the screen now. So thank you for that. And let us together go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much that your loving eye is upon us. Your hand protects us. You always provide a way, even when there seems to be no way. And to be invited into your family is a great rich richness, a wealth, even an embarrassment of wealth. Lord, thank you for successful surgeries for Karen Engstrom and for Janet Brides. We ask that you help them both in their recovery to fully mend, and that you help everyone who is helping them and who perhaps has a new or extended duty because of their recoveries. We ask, Lord, that you would hold close uh, Carrie Brown, uh, who appears to be dying of pancreatic cancer, their family, her husband, Andy. Also, that you'd be with Doris Lewis and her cancer treatment with Samantha, Mim's granddaughter, who has an a ongoing fever and headache that is evading diagnosis right now. We pray for accurate diagnosis and successful treatment. Would you be with Fred Johnson's sister, 
Rose, who's had a stroke and is dealing with dementia. Please be with the little baby Maxwell, who's in the NICU, and dad is due to be deployed. Lord, would you give Maxwell strength and growth? Would you have your hand upon dad and, and uh, that he might be able to be the support he needs to be to his family? We ask, Lord, for your mercy and healing on Dave Goodrow, a retired fighter, firefighter and EMT, dealing with Parkinson's and breathing problems, and home now under hospice care. Would you be with his wife, Chris, and his family? We pray for Lori, Marianne Johnson's Florida neighbor, that she would recover from COVID. We thank you for the progress in the vaccine distribution. We thank you for the new vaccine just approved and pray that you would indeed cause the distribution to be effective, to be safe, to be done with equity and with good speed. Lord, would you have your comforting hand upon the friends and family of Bill Holt, who was laid to rest yesterday, let their grief lead them to you, that they may find your embracing care and help. We ask, Lord, for you to intervene in the life of a friend who's having unjust legal problems. We pray that truth would prevail and that the ex exhausting ordeal would be ended in a just way. Lord, the, uh, there's an enemy who is trying to interfere, and we just come to you asking you in confidence that you will cancel that enemy's um, assignment. We pray, Lord, that you would preserve, protect, and deliver. We pray, Lord, for the nation of Myanmar under such a upset, and especially for Elvis Sado and other Christians and Christian leaders that are connected to us and to the New Day community in Quincy. We pray for further progress in uh, the court case that will allow Corley and Celine to reunite with, with Steve in Florida. We pray for the school systems and especially this new movement towards returning to at least four day school. We pray, Lord, for you to be Lord of that, that the right thing would be done. And in our world, Lord, in our country, we pray that politics would take a back seat to public service. We pray that righteousness would be as important as justice. And truly, really, you can't have one without the other. And help us to know. Help us, Lord, in our daily opportunities to speak a word of praise of what you have done, to point to the grace that is in you, and to be your hands and feet at every opportunity. We thank you that this annual meeting is one more opportunity of us to be really a team together, Help us to be the family of God. And together as a family, we pray as Jesus has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. <clears throat> what return shall I make to the Lord for all his goodness to me? You know, I will fulfill my vows. I will, in his sanctuary, I will give him praise. And we are in God's sanctuary wherever we call upon Jesus' name. We're so aware that those participating with us remotely are part of our life together. And week after week, I hope some of you also take the time to 
that are here. Take time to see the greetings from the folks who are on Facebook. It's a sweet and encouraging thing. And we are a community together. And thank you to everyone who gives. There's baskets here, folks who mail in their pledges, who use the donate tab um, on the homepage. Thank you so very much. It is a privilege to be part of a community that finds the way to serve God, even in these circumstances. Let us um, go to God in prayer to dedicate our offerings, and then we'll join in our, in our song of thanksgiving. Let's pray. God, you have given unto us all that we need and more. When we've had lean times in our lives, you have, you have pulled through. You have pulled us through. And we ask, Lord, that you would be honored even as we bring these gifts to you. That you would dedicate them to your purposes, but also that we would be dedicated, fully yours, and just bring honor to you in all that we do, all that we say. So accept these gifts, Lord, and use them to your purposes. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Jesus to Calvary did go, his love for sinners to show, what he did there brought hope from despair, oh how he loves you, oh how he loves me, oh how he loves me. You and me. Please be seated and give your attention to the reading of the word. Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 109, verses 1 through 8 and 26 through 31. Do not be silent, O God of my praise. For wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They beset me with words of hate and attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, even while I make prayer for them. So they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. They say, appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand on his right. When he is tried, let him be found guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few. May another seize his position. Help me, O Lord, my God. Save me according to your steadfast love. Let them know that this is your hand. You, O Lord, have done it. Let them curse, but you will bless. Let my assailants be put to shame. May your servant be glad. May my accusers be clothed with dishonor. May they be wrapped in their own shame as in a mantle. With my mouth, I will give great thanks to the Lord. I will praise him in the midst of the throng. For he stands at the right hand of the needy to save them from those who would condemn them to death. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Ellie. I look at my manuscript and the last page is on top. You don't mind if I fix that, do you? <laughs>
When you attend a graduation from high school on up, there's usually a phrase said that only occasionally is heard and even more rarely understood. I know it was said at my college and my seminary graduations, but I had to look it up after. Apparently, with my degree came all the rights and privileges thereunto appertaining. Sounds like something Jay would have to explain for us. <laughs> Especially at high school and college, I was too exhausted just making it to graduation to wonder what rights and privileges I had earned, but I had no idea what was appertaining and where the there was I was going unto. And later I realized, because I got that piece of paper, there were things I could do that I couldn't have gotten away with before. The Chronicles of Narnia. Classic fa fantasy literature filled with Christian symbolism and deep lessons. In the fifth of the book, the horse, the fifth of the books, The Horse and His Boy, Shasta is the, is the principal character, a boy. He's raised the son of a coarse and unloving fisherman in the foul country of Kellerman. Shasta escapes to freedom on talking horses. He saves Narnia, from and the neighboring country of Arkenland from invasion and along the way learns the truth about himself. He'd actually been born the eldest son and heir of the king of Arkenland, but was kidnapped as an infant. After Shasta has completed his adventure, he's restored to his heritage and grows up to be a greatly revered king in Arkenland. Learning his true identity changed his destiny, and gave him access to the rights and privileges thereunto appertaining. You might have noticed already that our Lenten series, it, the journey explores the con contradictory yet all too believable examples of human behavior that paved the path that led Jesus to the cross, hence enraged by a healing. Today's reading from the Gospel of Luke tells of a time when religious authorities who would hound Jesus all the way up Mount Calvary were outraged that Jesus would, on a Sabbath day, heavens, restore a woman to wholeness after she'd been bent double with her illness for 18 years. Jesus is not deterred by the anger of the authorities because he is on a mission from which he will not be sidetracked. The result of that mission is that God invites us into his family, which changes both our destiny and our identity. Please listen as I read Luke chapter 13, 10 to 17. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over. And was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath. I want to say, as if. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. This unassuming woman, like Shasta in the Narnia Chronicles, has a hidden identity. Where the world just sees a woman with a disability, Jesus sees a daughter of Abraham. No doubt, some see her as an expendable life and a drain on society. But Jesus sees a precious human soul 
created in the image of God. To be the daughter of Abraham is high privilege. Abraham is a common ancestor of everyone who believes in our God. But not every one of his biological descendants. Abraham is the one to whom a promise was, given, was made when he had no descendants at all. God promised that not only would he make of Abraham a great nation, those many descendants would enjoy great privileges. They would live in God's favor. And that blessing passed from Abraham to his son Isaac to his elder son Jacob, who was later given the name Israel. By the time many generations had passed and Jesus was born, the residents of the Holy Land, many were acting like God owed them the blessings of Israel simply because of their genealogy. When John the Baptist then went to the banks of the Jordan River to preach, throngs of people gathered to see this wild-haired man in camel skin point them in the direction of living in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> John was gracious to the sincere seeker, but, shall we say, less than diplomatic to the same leaders of the religious establishment that would later get their loincloths in a bunch over the miracles Jesus would do. They came to Jesus, I'm sorry, they came to the Jordan River, rather, not to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, but to pass judgment on what John was doing. John, having no time for diplomacy, is shown that he called these particular leaders of Israel's religious society, a bunch of snakes. Not necessarily the title that will win friends and influence people. Not quite tactful. But he knew they were leaning full bore on their genealogy and not on a heart that sought to please God. John didn't want to hear their false claims. So he said, do not presume to say for yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. To be a child of Abraham is to be a member of God's family. The Pharisees were right that it was important. They were wrong in thinking how one joined the family. The woman whom Jesus healed had come to the synagogue to worship God even though she'd been sick for 18 years. She did not allow her troubles to become an excuse to abandon her faith. Perhaps she realized that if she stopped trusting in God, she'd still have her problems, but wouldn't have anywhere to turn. Perhaps her life verse were those from Job, who in the midst of his suffering, instead of abandoning God, cried out, though he slay me, Yet will I trust in him. Jesus saw this woman and loved her. He called her to himself, laid his hands on her, and immediately she was straightened and gave praise to God. So in contrast to the false claims of the Pharisees, Jesus proclaimed the woman's true identity as a child of God. You see, she was being devalued. She's being treated worse than a donkey. When the Pharisees had the gall to say that healing her was a sin, hello, because it was done on the Sabbath, Jesus shredded their logic with a quick thrust of his sword, that is, his word. He said, now, nah, if she was a donkey or an ox, you wouldn't hesitate to untie it and lead it to fresh water, just as a matter of course of taking care of that dumb animal. But this woman is a daughter of Abraham, clinging to her faith in spite of a lack of visible benefits. And you would have me not untie a daughter of Abraham from the bondage that has kept her doubled over in pain for 18 long years? I'm sure he added, huh? <laughs> oh, no. Our God is a loving God. Our God is a powerful God. 
And even though the wicked and deceitful men spoke against him with lying tongues, Jesus set her free without delay. That's how good God is. We also read the passage from Ephesians, back and forth, when Ellie led us so well. Often in that chapter from Ephesians, we focus on the grace by which we were saved, by which we are saved, that grace that comes through faith, which is not of ourselves, but is the gift of God. Not long ago, we looked at the good works part of that passage, the good works that God has prepared for us ahead of time to order our lives. But there's a series of three verbs early in that reading that are fascinating, powerful, and just a little bit obscured in their translation to English. Paul is speaking to believers and wants them to understand the great love with which God has loved them. In spite of being dead in our sins, God has given us life together with Christ, has raised us up together with Christ, and has given us the awesome privilege of a seat in God's throne room in heaven. He gave us seats together with Christ. It's kind of like you went to Fenway and somebody's in the bleachers, but uh, oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing the, t- the team owner's box. You know, I'm seated together with the VIP. That's what God gives us. He seats us together with Christ. Pride goes before a fall. But if we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, he will lift us up. God invites us into his family. Intent on changing both our destiny and our identity. However, sometimes that is hard to see. Sometimes you might not be feeling it. We live in a fallen and a broken world. Corruption and evil abound. The soft and tender voice of Jesus calling us, come home is drowned out by a rancid clamor. In its brokenness, the world tells us we are unworthy. But in the only eyes that matter, we, like Shasta, are royalty. In the same way that the Pharisees treated the woman doubled over in her illness, the systems of this passing world will devalue us. Every time you are pressured into making a purchase, you're being treated as being an end to a means by those seeking a sale. Every time politicians deceive you about their opponents or about their own actions, you are treated as if you are not worthy of the truth. Every time you are pressured to go into debt and then hounded by collection agents once you've complied with their wishes, you're treated more like a donkey or an ox than as a daughter or son of Abraham. This world tells us we are unworthy. Sad to say, the world devalues us. No no doubt you have looked at the many eyewitness testimonies of Jesus' power to heal in in the New Testament, but also in the centuries since, and even in recent years. You've heard the testimony but lay that against the instance, or perhaps many instances, known to you where someone really loved the Lord, really sought the Lord for healing, and still died. Prayer for the sick has been shown more effective than not praying, even in clinical trials, most famously at St. Luke's Hospital in Kansas City. But not always. This is why Paul wrote in the book of Romans, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The creation itself knows that corruption has gotten into its very workings. The sickness and the dying, they're not our Father's will. For now we live in a fallen world in which healing may not come. The last enemy to be defeated will be death itself. And that's good news. The poet John Donne, I loved how he said it. Death be not proud. Death, thou shalt die. 
We're like the free French living under the Nazi occupation, looking around at what is going up wrong and being done wrong and saying, this is not as it ought to be and this is not as it will be. I will live according to my true identity. This world tells us we are unworthy. But God has invited us into his family. When we accept that invitation, it changes both our destiny and our identity. During Lent, we especially remember that Jesus came to die for us. But he also came to give witness to the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. Every time he healed, every, every time he healed, he established a beachhead. A beachhead of the kingdom, of where God ruled. Every time he brought the dead to life. Every time he fed the poor. Every time he gave value to those the world treated like donkeys and oxen. The Lone Ranger left behind a silver bullet. What are you going to do with that? Jesus left behind evidence of the kingdom of God breaking into this fallen, broken, desperate world. And this world has never been the same. Hospitals, higher education, even vastly improved human rights are all a result of those who accepted God's invitation to belong to his family, living according to their true identity. Paul says in Ephesians that part of God raising us up with Christ is that he has prepared good works for us to do as a demonstration that we belong to him. I want to remind you of the power that there is in doing the right thing. See, good works matter. Many of you contributed to help a particular family that was homeless and had a long struggle after being forced to leave. It was a rental that they'd been keeping up with, but the owner wanted it for someone else. And then for more than 18 months, this family lived out of their truck, and then their truck died. Your gifts to the pastor's discretionary fund helped them with temporary housing and bought a replacement truck. And then one of the brothers died. It seemed like things were getting worse. But there is healing in truly good works. They're not in a permanent place yet, but Christians reached out with the offer of a trailer to live in and a place to put it on. So meanwhile, the family is saving money and looking forward to a place they can call their own. Even if COVID time means it's on the phone or a video call, spending time with someone who is lonely heals. Sewing masks, gathering winter coats for Vietnam veterans like our youth did with your help. There are many, many opportunities for us to live according to our true identities and to allow the light of the kingdom of God to break into this world. God is working his purpose out. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Kathy was a young high school student in Connecticut. Her older sister, Nicole, had come to know Jesus personally through a retreat for teenagers. And younger sister Kathy was interested in learning more. Kathy came with Nicole for a week of Christian camp, which friends of mine managed the camp, and for that week I was director. And across the lake from this camp was an old broken down camp. It's actually in that black and white or sepia photo that you've got on the screen. It had been that camp had been thrown in with the purchase of the nicer one. And looking it over myself ahead of time, you know, you can see the bones of what had once been a highly sought after summer destination for the sons of mostly wealthy New York City families. In the mid 20th century, they would have to arrive by boat and stay for the summer. But the staff was astounding. One year they had a drama coach, a young struggling actor named Art Carney. But disrepair. The dream was to rebuild the camp across the lake 
For inner city kids to have access to a life where they could experience their true identities as children of Abraham, as members of God's family. Income from the camp that I was directing at would help finance the mission of camp across the lake. We took them across the lake in a whole bunch of canoes, trying to put at least one camper or counselor who knew what a J-stroke was on there, who could handle a canoe. And it was an adventure, and getting across was just, just a tad comic. But we made it across. It's one of those things where the only passing grade is 100%. Kathy was in my canoe. Once we arrived, we set to work doing our little bit to cause the kingdom of God to break into that particular corner of creation. We scraped and painted. We removed fresh mu freshwater mussels from the uh, sand where bare feet would take their first attempt at freshwater swimming. And then with a little more competency, I believe with a little more confidence in our identity as children of Abraham and members of the family of God, we canoed back and I told him I was proud of them and I called them my flotilla of faith. And when we were done, Kathy said, that was the best day of my life. God invites us into his family, granting us all the rights and privileges thereunto appertaining. And just as he did for the woman he healed in the synagogue, he changes both our destiny and our identity. Shall we pray? Mm. We thank you, God, that you love us so much you call us into your family. Help us, Lord, to see the truth and to not believe the lies. You've made us to be worthwhile, whereas the world would have us be pawns and tools. Help us, Lord, to treat everyone we meet as your special creation. Give us the grace to call others to come home. And Lord, defend each one of your daughters, each one of your sons. And let them not be bent over, but cause each one to stand up straight in you. Let us be agents of your purposes. And let this this church, gathered and dispersed at the same time, to be a tactical team for your purposes. Guide us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand, please, and we'll sing, We Are God's People. We are the 
Almighty God, we've gathered to worship, to hear your word, to allow it to work into our lives. Send us forth now to a meeting, but also to the lives you call each of us to, so that by living in our identity and embracing the new destiny you give us, we give you honor and praise now and always. Through Christ we pray. Amen. There is a full half hour before we meet, so restrooms, whatever you need. But uh, thank you all, and those tuning in, remember to go over to Zoom.